What do satellite TVs, water purifiers, and cordless vacuums all have in common? They are just some of the everyday technologies we use today that were developed as a result of early space exploration. President Kennedy kicked the space race into high gear when he challenged the United States to land a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. The development and success of America's space program would be part of his lasting legacy. From the Earth to the moon and beyond, we'll take you on a trip through NASA's 60-year history on this episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Well, welcome to this week's episode of JFK 35. I'm Matt Porter. And I'm Jamie Richardson. On October 1st of this year, NASA turns 60 years old, and as we'll see later in the episode, continues the mission articulated by President Kennedy to explore space and expand our knowledge for the benefit of all mankind. We'll hear from NASA's chief historian, who will tell us about some of the technologies we use every day that were first developed in the early space program. And we'll also speak with Rory Kennedy, daughter of Robert and Ethel Kennedy. She has a new documentary on the accomplishments made during NASA's first 60 years and where we must go from here. But first, a story from the JFK Library's archives. Like all presidents, President Kennedy received countless letters from people all over the country. Some were messages of support, some requested aid from the president, while others questioned his policy and ideas. One of the letters in the archives here falls into the latter category. It's from a 13-year-old girl from Michigan named Mary Lou Reitler. Written after JFK's 1961 pledge to send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth, but before his September 1962 speech at Rice University, you may know it as the We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, she opens by stating that if God wanted man to orbit the Earth or to go to the moon, he, quote, would have put us up there himself, end quote. She then questions why we're going to space and spending so much money that would be better used on more immediate and pressing needs here at home, noting that, quote, we don't really need space vehicles, unquote. She outlines her arguments against space travel, which was something many other people were questioning at the time. Why spend so much time and money on a space program when there are so many issues at home that could use the money for, from the budget? Well, and that's why one of President Kennedy's senior advisors wrote on behalf to answer this precocious middle schooler. Deputy Special Counsel Meyer Feldman acknowledges first that Mary Lou does have the right to her beliefs. He adds in the letter that one of God's gifts, however, is natural intelligence and curiosity that has allowed civilizations to advance from the Stone Age to an era of modern medicines, technology, and other inventions that have eased life's hardships. He says to Mary Lou that there is a precedent of civilization finding all sorts of advancements that sometimes begin with pursuits that on their face don't show a lot of practical use. Now Feldman quotes astronaut John Glenn, someone we're all familiar with, who told Congress that exploration and the pursuit of knowledge have always paid dividends in the long run, and they're usually far greater than anyone could have expected. Despite still being only 13 years old, Mary Lou's stance wasn't all that uncommon either. It was hard to get everyone in the nation on board for such an expensive, potentially dangerous, and possibly fruitless venture. Well, other than beating the Soviets to the moon, which seemed like a possibility at certain moments in the space race, it was hard to imagine what we could actually gain from going into space. But what we would find out is that the United States and the rest of the world would reap a lot more from these missions than just putting a flag on the moon. Now, I had the chance to talk with NASA's chief historian, Dr. Bill Barry, who gave us a closer look at the inventions created as a result of our forays out of the atmosphere. Cordless power tools are found in almost every homeowner's garage in America, but without the Apollo program, developing the technology may have taken years longer, says NASA's chief historian, Dr. Bill Barry. Uh, it, it, having cordless power tools was probably a great idea, but who was going to spend the money to figure out how to make that happen until we had a reason to do it? Uh, and, and the reason was the Apollo program. <laughs> On the phone from his Washington, D.C. office, Barry says NASA's need for a reliable cordless option to drill on the moon pushed the tool's development forward. They went to Black & Decker 
you know, uh, you know, commercial company said, hey, we'd, you know, we'd like you to see if you can figure out a way to do this. And those folks, you know, did some tests and they created, you know, uh, battery power tools. Uh, it was a lot better than having a 250,000 mile long power cord back to Houston <laughs> uh, so they could run the drill on the moon. And if you enjoy taking selfies of you and your friends on your phone, you should thank NASA scientists who first developed the technology. They invented this thing called the CMOS chip. It was another way of, of making really tiny cameras for space probes. Uh, and it turns out we didn't wind up using it very much in, on the early, the early space probe that was invented. But um, a company called GoPro licensed it from, from the folks at JPL. And, uh, and the world changed right after that. I like not having to carry around a 35 millimeter camera with me anymore as a separate thing because I've got it on my phone. I could take great pictures of my phone. And that's all thanks to that the CMOS chip that was invented at the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And for those who cherish a good night's sleep, your memory foam mattress was another early space program innovation. They wanted to find a way to make lighter weight uh, foam that would absorb shocks but also not cause hot spots on astronauts who have, might have to sit on this stuff for a long period of time. So, you know, that, that, that project, product gets developed. Barry jokingly says people think of NASA as simply launching their taxpayer dollars into space. But he says the country has benefited from many innovations at home as a result of space exploration. What NASA does is the kind of things with you know, people's tax dollars uh, that industry won't do. Uh, or can't afford to do or, or may not want to take the risk of, of doing. It created completely new industries that just didn't exist before that have had a huge impact on our lives that, that we just sort of take for granted now. One of the most important early inventions came in the form of satellites. Barry says almost as soon as the first satellite went up, the government realized the huge potential for monitoring the Earth from space. Most people didn't realize uh, just how much of a difference it would make being able to visualize these things and you know what an incredible platform was how much information you could get from not just pictures but the other instruments that wound up on weather satellites as well. We've applied in the technology to look at all sorts of things on Earth and we have all kinds of data sets on the weather and moisture contents and uh, you know, what the ground looks like and, and the tree cover and all, there's all kinds of things that, that our satellites have looked at over time. In one instance, Barry says scientists studying the ozone of Venus realized the same technology could examine the Earth's ozone layer. There's this cross feed of technology that, that keeps coming back uh, in practical ways uh, lots of practical ways and in ways often we don't even credit or think about. Barry says you can find the space program's fingerprints everywhere. A number of things that, that happened in the space program, you know, microcircuits, uh, communication satellites, uh, and lots of other things um, that, that have been pushed along by our investments in space technology uh, have brought us to a point now where we have instantaneous worldwide communication and it's practically free. It's largely a result of investments in technology made by government um, and in, in this case, largely by uh, in the space program uh, to create the infrastructure that allows that to happen. Barry says President Kennedy's call to go to the moon didn't just play out in space, but it has left a legacy of important technologies we continue to use today on Earth. Technologies, capabilities, ideas, and concepts that, that now have filtered into our lives in so many different ways and, and that have really changed the quality of life as we know it, I think largely for the better. Well, after learning more about the innovations of the early space program, we are now happy to sit down with Rory Kennedy. Rory is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and is also the youngest daughter of Robert and Ethel Kennedy. She also has a new film called Above and Beyond, NASA's Journey to Tomorrow. The film looks back at the last 60 years of space exploration and examines how NASA's mission helps us understand our own planet today. Rory, thank you for coming to the program. I'm very happy to be here. Well, this film, Rory, takes an inside look at NASA and the history of American space flight. The importance of innovation, particularly beating the Soviets into space, was a major point for your uncle, President Kennedy. So what was it like revisiting that era in history, and what, if anything, did you learn or come away with that you hadn't before? Yeah, well, I was approached to make this film by the Discovery Channel, and I, I, I left it the chance. And part of it was because of my connection to NASA, really uh, because of Jack's involvement in getting us to the moon. And, you know, that extraordinary speech that he gave at Rice University in 1962, where he said, we're going to get to the moon within the decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. 
And I remember so well growing up in the aftermath of the Apollo program and the excitement that we all felt about this idea of going to the moon, of sending somebody to outer space to 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 put a foot on another planet, another on our moon. It's such an extraordinary thing. And so it was very thrilling to me to be able to go back to this incredible era, but not to only celebrate what we accomplished 50, 60 years ago, but looking over the last six decades in all of the extraordinary accomplishments of NASA. And so what made Kennedy's call to space different from others who were looking at it before or even after his particular message? Well, I think we delivered. <laughs> <laughs> so in that respect, it was uh, it was pretty unique. I mean, I think that um, if you look back to where we were before NASA and before that speech in ni- 1962, NASA began a few years earlier in 1958 under the Eisenhower administration. But, you know, we really didn't have much, by the way, of rocket ships. We had never gone to even low Earth orbit. We had never, um, we didn't have the capacity to to go, you know, the idea that within a decade we were going to build something that could go 240,000 miles to get to the moon, go through the atmosphere of the moon, land on the moon, and then bring people back safely is awesome. It's incredible. <laughs> and to do it and to say we're going to do it within the decade is is almost outrageous. I mean, it's so hard to imagine, but I think it speaks to Jack, to his extraordinary leadership, to his ability to envision something and to then put the, put the support together and the team together and and really get behind NASA in a way to enable them to do this. You know, at that point, at the height of the Apollo program, uh, NASA had 5% of the budget for this country. Today, it hovers more around 0.5%. But it took his leadership to say, we're going to invest these resources. We're going to make this happen. We're going to bring in the greatest minds and and put the money behind it to invest in the resources to get us there. And, and you know, we did it. So when Nixon came into office, we landed, you know, landed on the moon under Nixon. And then he seemed to have not the same driver impetus to really continue with NASA. How do you think what changed in their priorities with that administration? Yeah, well, you know, the thing about NASA and how NASA is structured is that it is part of the executive branch. So, you know, the boss of NASA changes every four to eight years. And sometimes because of that, it's hard to have the consistency to keep to a particular mission. And what's amazing is knowing that over the last 60-year history of NASA, and seeing how much it's been able to accomplish despite that. And so, you know, what you saw really in the in the 70s is a, an effort towards unmanned space missions. And during that period was also when we started focusing more directly on Earth. They launched the the Landsat satellite, which was the first the first satellite in 1972 which actually started taking images of Earth. And we were seeing a a much more complete picture and much more detailed picture of what this planet looked like. And what our film does over the course of the hour and a half is, is looks at this kind of tension of NASA looking outward and helping us understand our solar system, helping us understand our galaxy, helping us understand the universe by going deeper and deeper into space. But the deeper NASA has gone, the more it's come to appreciate Earth and the preciousness of this planet and its uniqueness. Because after all, with all that NASA has traveled, with all that it has taught us, which is an extraordinary amount, we have yet to find another planet like this. And we have yet to find other life in the universe. So, 
you know, and I think when you see those images of Earth, which I've now spent a, a lot of time, NASA images, and, you know, there's this little blue ball hanging in that the vastness of space and the darkness of space. It's a reminder of how extraordinary this planet is. And, you know, what the film, I think, comes to really understand over the course of it is that we humans are really having a, an impact on this planet in a very concerning way. And that, um, that you know, and what we're learning more and more from NASA research is that the path we are on is deeply concerning. You mentioned, I think, in the movie's trailer that the next great challenge NASA must meet, and it's one we must win, is what's happening here on the planet. Can you describe more about exactly what that is? Is it climate change or, you know, how, and how can NASA help us win that challenge? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's confusing for a lot of people when you think, well, I knew NASA went up to outer space and and explored with rockets and rovers and all the rest, but I don't really understand what they're doing here on Earth. So basically, NASA um, helps us understand this planet uh, largely through satellites. So they have 19 satellites that are orbiting the Earth at any given moment and right now. Each of those satellites are looking at various systems that create our Earth. So they're looking at the weather. They're looking at the health of the oceans and the coral reefs. <clears throat> they're looking at how warm the oceans are. They're looking at how much ice is melting in the Arctic and in Antarctica as well. They're looking at things that we can't see, things like carbon and gases and how they're um, changing our planet systems. They're looking at agriculture. They're looking at the, the, the overall temperature of the earth. In looking at all of these systems, and then they have airplanes that are on the ground, and I went with NASA both to Antarctica and the Arctic, on aircraft to validate the findings of these satellites. Mm -hmm. And then they also have people on the ground. And I was also in the Arctic with them on the ground and we went to Hawaii and there have scientists all over the planet who are validating both the aircraft and the satellites. They've now had all of this information coming in over decades. And so what it does is they then f take that information, they feed it into two scientists who turn it into models. And those models create a picture of what's happening on this Earth right now and what's going to happen to this planet. And those models are solid. Yeah. And they're foolproof. And um, their results of that science is deeply, deeply concerning. Mm -hmm. And what that is telling us is that the urgency is right now. By 2040, yeah. this planet is going to be drastically changed if we don't make changes right now. Do they have any recommendations for, I know they, maybe outside of their scope, but they give us these warnings, like is there, is there a hope for this, I suppose? Well, that is outside of NASA's scope. So what NASA does is it um, is a civilian agency, which means it, it gathers all this information, and then it makes it available to not only scientists in this country and the general public, but scientists and the g general public all over the planet. And they provide it to us, the citizens, and they provide it to our legislators and policymakers. And then the idea is that we change policies to address the scientific information that is being presented to us. And that is really the job of our legislators and our leadership. And, you know, it's actually one of the, um, ex the, the really wonderful experiences I've had in making this film is looking back at that moment of John F. Kennedy's speech at Rice University in 1962 where he talks about going to the moon within the decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard and because it's human nature to go explore, to go into the stars, to see what's out there, to pull in that knowledge. 
And we don't know necessarily what we're going to learn, but we're going to push ourselves to keep learning. And it's such a it's such a um, extraordinary moment of leadership where he rallied the entire country around that vision, and that's what we need now with climate change. We need that kind of leadership that's bringing out the best in all of us, that brings us together towards this common goal that we as humans have on this planet to protect it, to protect ourselves, to protect it for our children and our children's children, all the animals and all the species. That's what we need to do. And you mentioned us, and us is more than just Americans. In President Kennedy's time, we were racing against the Soviets for space superiority, but now that us is not just Americans, it's cosmonauts from Russia, it's Chinese scientists, it's European scientists. Um, how do you find this, that not only is this happening, but it's sort of happening at an international level with NASA, isn't it? Well, yes. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think one of the great examples of, of international collaboration is the International Space Station. And, you know, that is a machine that is moving at 17,500 miles an hour orbiting the Earth. It's a million pounds. It was constructed with the uh, collaboration of a number of different countries, including uh, Russia, the United States, Japan, Canada, China, um, South Korea. And it is a huge success story. It's probably the most impressive scientific laboratory in the history of humankind. And it is um, a testimony to how well uh, we can work together, maybe when we're not on planet Earth, but we have, <laughs> but, to, leave to, we for that have to leave. But my hope is that maybe it'll teach us something about how we can best operate down here. But it, it has been a great collaboration right now. Um, I think many people don't realize that we're no longer sending humans up to the International Space Station. We're not sending astronauts ourselves. They're going through Russia on the Soyuz. And so R Russia sends all of our astronauts up to the ISS and, and brings them back down. Um, and you know we're now collaborating more directly with some of the private companies here, like SpaceX and Boeing, to, um, to start the initiative to be able to send astronauts up ourselves and, and NASA and those companies are working hand in hand towards that effort. But in any case, I think that um, understanding really what an, an awesome feat that International Space Station is, is, is certainly testimony to the importance of the collaborative efforts, both um, you know with scientists in this country, but also abroad. Rory, it's been great talking with you about your film, Space, and your uncle's contributions to the progress at NASA. Um, how can people see your film? Oh, well, thank you for asking. It's going to be on the Discovery Channel, and it will also be available on demand um, and on Discovery On Demand and Discovery Go, and also on the Science Channel. So thank you so much, Rory. It's a super fascinating topic. I think we could listen to talk about space and astronauts endlessly. Um, we appreciate your time today. It's been great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, thank you. Well, it's been quite an episode. Some would say out of this world. Oh, oh well there. Yeah. You're right, Jamie, though. It has been an amazing episode. I've, I've learned a lot. I don't know about you. You know, it, for me, the end of this comes back to that letter that we were wrote, that we heard from Mary Lou at the very beginning, which was, why are we going into space? You know, we don't need space vehicles. But what did we get out of it? We've gotten, you know, smartphone cameras, we've got memory phone, cordless power tools, all sorts of technologies that weren't necessarily on people's radar until the space program started to need these innovations for themselves. Yeah, I think that's pretty amazing to think about. And I think that's well worth the investment of the last six years. And they're years. also commonplace now. I mean, it's incredible that, you know, how many times do you take out your camera on your phone to take a photo? Every and day. Every day, every second, documenting this episode on my smartphone. So this is incredible. Another thing, speaking of cameras, when we were talking to Rory, I kept thinking of that very famous photo of the Earth taken, I believe, from the moon. And it's one of the first images we have people saw in the 1970s of the planet they live on. And that... To me, as somebody who was born after this, 
to think that there was the first time somebody ever saw that, whereas now it's so commonplace. It really is incredible. Yeah, I believe that photo is actually called Earthrise. And it, Thank you. And it is an amazing photo. You know, what it was is, like I think Rory had said, it was the first time man went from looking into the stars to looking back at its own planet and realizing how precious and fragile and what an amazing world we have, being able to see it from the view from the moon was pretty amazing. If all of you want to learn more, uh, Rory's movie is out on Discovery Channel and available on Discovery's streaming service. There's also a companion book, also called Above and Beyond, that you can read, mostly aimed at young adults, so get them maybe for your kids to inspire them into a world of space and exploration. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of JFK 35. I think it's been one of my favorites so far. I know it's only the third episode, so I'm probably Each gonna, one is better than the next. Probably going to say that every week, but visit our podcast page at jfklibrary.org forward slash JFK 35, where we'll have some links to the photos and the letter mentioned on this episode. And if you have questions or story ideas, please email us at jfk 35 pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us please at jfk library using the hashtag jfk35 you can also follow us on facebook and instagram and if you liked what you heard here today please consider subscribing to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts or leaving us a review this really helps us get up in the rankings and to get discovered and we will see you again in two weeks for another episode thanks for listening and have a great week